So um, that's me. And uh, this is our official, um, our official title of our paper, the five-year outcomes of our, of our randomized control trial. It's the pivotal resume trial. So what's the objective of, what was the objective of this, uh, this five-year study? Uh, it's hard to believe it's over. Um, one, of course, is to look at the safety and efficacy of resume therapy as it pertains to lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, the primary endpoints, safety and efficacy. So a couple of things worth mentioning about that trial. It was randomized and it was sham controlled. It included any kind of prostate between 30 and 80 grams. And that means middle lobes were not excluded, something very pertinent. Uh, and this is a kind of a durability ana analysis of per protocol and 60 months, five years. So pretty, uh, pretty, pretty long trial. And you can see the co-authors and you know, thank, thank all of those uh, guys for pitching in on this very important trial. Next slide. And again, this was accepted to the Journal of Urology last month, and you can access it through PubMed already. So going right to the chase here, the important, I'd say the two important aspects of this. If we look on the left side, the IPSS uh, score, you can see like a standard BPH trial, uh, you know, surgical trial, men are coming into the trial in, with severe symptoms at 22. They get treated and by three months. Uh, that score has plummeted. Uh, 10 to 10.6%. And then note that score is stable over the ensuing um, um, five years. So a prompt improvement and durable for five years. We get a similar stor story on flow rate. Men coming in uh, with a suppressed flow, an obstructed flow, uh, with the, at the three month mark, they've already had a significant improvement in their score. And again, that's, excuse me, on their flow rate. And that Qmax, that flow rate is sustained for the entire five-year period. Next slide. So two other aspects that we did measure, like many trials do, um, looking at the IPSS quality of life, that's sometimes called the bother score. And again, a marked improvement, again, sustained for the 60-month period of time. And there's a research tool that's kind of a sophisticated bother instrument called the BPH Impact Index. That's the BPH II there uh, on the right-hand slide. And essentially, that's that's a measure of how how the urination symptoms have been impacting the patient's life. And a lower number is better. And you can see again a marked improvement that's sustained over the 60-month period. Next slide, please, Tom. Now, I know many of you are going to wonder and ask about sexual function. And so we put this out, I guess, as a teaser. Um, I had shown this previously at the AUA, uh, and there is a manuscript to be submitted shortly focused on sexual function. But, and it's a good story. When we look at the IIEF, the erectile function, notice that that's the top graph there. It's a, it's a flat line across. You can hardly see the standard deviations. I mean, other, other um, confidence intervals, very tight curve. So basically um, uh, stable sexual function throughout the entire study. Uh, and when we look at ejaculation, notice those, those two scores, the MSHQ function and the M uh, MSHQ bother. Uh, again, those are uh, uh, bothers improved and uh, ejaculatory function is stable again throughout the entire trouble. So no de novo erectile dysfunction and a limited impact on any other aspect of sexual function. And expect to read more about this in the ensuing months as our manuscript uh, goes through the process. There are going to be some questions about catheterization. So I thought we just handle it right now. Um, from the trial, 90% 90, 90 of the men uh, got catheters at the end of the at the end of the treatment during the pivotal trial. And this was at the discretion of the treating physician. If we look at those men in the crossover arm, so those were men whose treatment was delayed at, le at least six months because they were in the sham and then later they crossed over, um, that they're also about the same rate. Um, my own personal feeling is um, all of my men I catheterize at the end of the trial. I certainly prepare them for that. And it looks like 90% of the guys in the trial were doing that. Um, um, interesting, the important 
question of patients is, well, how long? And the average here is 3.4 days. And so that's what I tell patients that the average is 3.4 days. Next slide, please, Tom. So how long does the procedure take? So this was measured during the trial. And there's, I think, um, two messages here. Um, I tell patients it takes about five minutes, uh, five to 10 minutes, depending on how many applications of steam. And the average here is very short at 5.3. Now, if you notice, the crossover is a minute short. Why is that? Well, they weren't a minute smaller. Um, remember, this was delayed three, three months later. So these are guys, by this time, the investigators are, uh, they're learning how to, they're learning to be efficient. They're learning how, how this treatment really goes. And they've, they've knocked off a minute uh, uh, by the three month delay uh, for the crossover. So, um, but I mean, I still tell them five to, patients five to 10 minutes if it takes less than that. Uh, but you, know, you, get, you get better at it, you get uh, more efficient. And then how many different applications of steam? You know, someplace around four to five. And, and of course that's related to prostate volume. When prostates get bigger, we tend to treat more. Uh, when you get bigger middle lobes, you tend to treat uh, a, a time or two more. So um, usually one more. Um, so anyway, good information for you to understand and, and um, discuss with your patients uh, when you introduce this concept to them. It's a fast procedure, not that we're in a rush, but now middle lobe, I, this is an important point because um, unlike other treatments, um, middle lobes were included. Well, let's say middle lobes were not, were not excluded. And here you see displayed IPSS changes on the left and flow rate on the right. And it's broken out, at least at the one year mark, broken out by those that had a middle lobe um, treated and those with a middle lobe not treated. And, um, you know, if you see a middle lobe, treat it. It looks like uh, doing that is important. That middle lobe is a, probably a very important component of the LUTs presentation. And if middle lobe is there, you have median tissue, a median bar, or a formal middle lobe with clefting on both sides, don't be shy. Uh, uh, men tolerate it just fine. And it looks like you get some extra bang for your buck when you do that. So I would encourage uh, you to consider that. I wouldn't say overly aggressive, but wouldn't want to shy away. In a sense, Resume can handle the, the presentation of the prostate that you learned that day. When you look in uh, on, on that case, if there's middle lobes, you're going to be able to handle it. If it's just by low bar BPH, you can handle that just as well. Okay, so um, I think this is a take home message right here about retreatment. Um, you can see displayed. Uh, the bar graph, the darker blue are those men who were treated in the pivotal trial and then subsequently had a surgical retreatment. The light, lighter blue are men whose retreatment was solely medicine. They went back on a, an alpha blocker or something, and, and the majority of it was an alpha blocker. So um, at the end of five years, retreatment rates of four, surgical retreatment rates of 4.4%. Uh, that is very enviable. That is, that is a very low rate, but there's a second message with that. Look at how low surgical retreatment is at year two. It's 3.7. It hardly budges over the, from year two to year five. So um, the message is that retreatment rate is low and, um, and that we may be seeing a, a, a very long-term implication of the outcome of this treatment by seeing that stability and retreatment rate as you get as you go all the way out to five years it occurs. If it's going to occur, it's going to be low. It's going to occur early, and for the rest of the trial, those patients weren't weren't needing additional treatment. So I think that's an important message. If you remember, a lot of the missed therapies in the past failed because of this retreatment. They don't all come back in for something else. We're not seeing this here. Next slide, please. So the key take, takeaways, again, as I just mentioned, a very low surgical retreatment rate, 4.4%, and a medical retreatment rate around 11%, again, at five years. There's a significant impact on symptoms, 
IPSS, on flow rate, the, Q, the Qmax, and then the quality of life and bother indices that we always measure. And remember, you can treat the lateral lobes, the central, middle lobe. I mean, what you see on the day you do your procedure, you're going to be able to handle it. It's an in-office procedure. It's safe and preserves sexual function.